еще. Welcome, everyone. We are from Toastmaster International. Today, we will pre just present ourselves, and then we will introduce what we will be doing today. So my name is Aldrich Kelly. I am the president of Toastmaster, Inter Toastmaster International, one of the clubs that are here at the university. And we are very excited to share this moment with you guys. And um, hopefully, you can learn quite a lot, and please, uh, at the end, there will be a lot of uh, opportunities for questions and also in between. Good morning, everyone. My name is Phyllis, and I am the Vice President of Public Relations of just the club that is here in our university. So just a little question. Who of you have heard, has already heard of Toastmasters International? Do you know what that is? Just shout it out. Presentations. Presentations, okay. What else? Okay, did you know that we have a club here in our university? Yeah? Right, so we have a club and we meet every, month, uh, every Wednesday at six o'clock. And we're just a bunch of people that use that club environment to practice our public speaking skills. And it's not only public speak speaking, but also communication and leadership skills. So this is really something that we learned and today we get the chance to present it here to you. And of course, we don't only want to have the skills for ourselves, and that's why we're sharing them with you. Yeah, so this is Paula. <laughs> Maybe you introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Paula. I'm a IBMS fourth year. I don't have a fancy position in Toastmaster anymore. You fancy yourself, right? I'm fancy myself, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, no, but I was um, quite currently representing the Toastmaster, Hague University Toastmaster at an area competition. I did not win, but I at least got there, so that, that's started, I would say. And um, I think that'll be it from me. Yeah, so I would say that we just start our presentation and you are free to ask questions afterwards, whatever you want to know. Since we're not that many people, I have an idea. Would you mind all coming down a little bit? Because it's really nice to sit in the last row, but I think it's, it's a nicer atmosphere if we're all closer together. Also, because this is an interactive presentation, which means it's nicer if we all interact and are closer together. I mean, you guys. Would you mind coming down? Just Great. to say, Thank if you, you stay up there, you we will be asking only you up there. Come down. <laughs> oh, yeah, she, didn't want, <laughs> she didn't want to participate. So there's nothing cringy for you, so you don't no. have to be worried. I just think it's a nicer atmosphere if you're closer. And also, since we're not that many people, I think in the end especially, we can give you, if you have particular questions, we can give you specific feedback. So that's really great. If you, if you just have any questions, just write them down and ask us afterwards. Great. I think, okay. Audrey, you can start. We shall. Imagine in a parallel universe, Elon Musk arrived in his electronic spaceship from Mars, giving a lecture here at the university. You're all excited, so you come rushing to get a nice seat. Elon Musk walk and take a long list and start reading for three hours in a monotonous voice. Wouldn't you be disappointed? Let's come back to this universe. Have you ever been in a presentation where you felt like really nervous or anxiety rising up? Or you lost your words, you lost your structure? Or you just want to run away? Or people just not listening, they're not paying attention, they're on their cell phone? How disappointed would that be? How many of you have been through that? I'm guilty as charged as well. <laughs> so 
So today, Paula, Phyllis, and I would like to show you some techniques that will turn this around. And these techniques will help you uh, be happy because you, people will actually listen to you. You will be, feel validated. It will give you some confidence because you know what you're doing. You know how you're communicating, how the people are responding to you. And by doing this, we will focus on three things. The first, the content. The second, delivery. And third, the state. Our experience in Toastmaster will also include this so we can give you the maximum amount. And this will not only help you in your future presentations, but it will also help you in negotiations, in your future job, even in simple conversations. So please, let's give a warm welcome for Paula. That was lovely, thank you. So as Aldrich said, I will be talking today about content. What is a content? What do you need to know about content? So from my point of view, I'll be talking about three, oh, okay, three different areas that are very important. So first is how to organize your speech, second is research your topic, and third one is get to the point. So let's start with the first one, all right? Organize your speech. Again, there are three different areas that I'm going to talk about. Maybe a little bit confusing, I know, three, 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 a lot of threes, but it happens. So what is important about organizing your speech? First of all, why do you need to organize your speech? Anybody ideas? You can already see it maybe there. Yeah? Very well, yes, that's absolutely true. So the first of all, when you organize your speech, it's easier to understand and remember. So if I would, for example, if I would be talking about organization and blah, 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 and all of a sudden, I just say, however, body language, and just like jump back to the body language and then back to the content. You will not remember anything from the presentation because you will be confused about what is the actual point of this presentation. So as I said, it's easier to understand and remember. Also, if it's correctly organized, you seem more credible and also your presentation or your speech seem more credible. And the very last, people enjoy it more, okay? When they're not confused, they like it. Apparently we are creature of habit and repeating stuff and going in a row, it's better for us to understand. The next topic is select the topic. That was a lovely sentence. So why do you need to select a topic? Imagine you're going to give a presentation, but you don't know what about. You just like stand there and like, okay, what am I supposed to talk about, right? The world has endless topics. You can pick literally anything, whether it's your speech just to give a speech to your friends or to give speech on a stage or give a presentation to your boss. It doesn't matter. Every speech should have some kind of point. So our point today is for you to inform you about Toastmaster and about how to present, right? That's like the main point. But your point can be, why is sun yellow? It doesn't matter, whatever you pick, it's your point and you need to focus. So that's one thing that can help you organize your speech to find the actual point, what you want to tell by this presentation. And the last one is make an outline. I will go a little bit in depth, but you already have heard this before. Every presentation, every speech needs opening, body and conclusion or closing, whatever you want to say. So let's first look at opening. Do you remember the first word that Aldrich said when he started a presentation? Anybody? He started with like specific word. Very well done, thank you. Imagine, that's Aldrich's go-to word, word when he starts presenting. He comes up and say, imagine, paint me a picture. It's an attention grabber. So for opening, it's very important to have something that will capture the audience, that they will either remember or they will 
get them intrigued. You can use joke. You can start with a joke. You can, uh, you can give a metaphor. You can start with a regular just ladies and gentlemen for grabbing the actual attention of everybody around, right? You can use imagine. You can say rhetorical question. What if kind of question. Tell me what would happen if I would now say you need to walk out. I didn't mean to point. <laughs> but you know, something that will grab them. So that's why there is the giant attention on the, I keep bubbing into it. Gra uh, giant attention. You need something that people will remember and actually keep focusing on your presentation further on. Something that will intrigue them. And also, you need to think about the link to your actual presentation. You can't just say, what is Sun of Blue? I will be talking about the presentation today. Where's the link there, okay? So you need to link your attention grabber, whether it's a joke, whether it's a statement, rhetoric, a rhetorical question, you need to actually link it to your speech. So anybody else knows or have some kind of like a specific opening uh, sentence? For example, whenever I start, I usually start with, Ladies and gentlemen, and then I put better question afterwards. That's my go-to. Do you have something like that? Anybody here? Open starting class, maybe? Something that will start. Great. So remember, in an opening, attention is the key. You need to grab the attention. Okay, let's move on to something that is also very important, and that's actual body of your presentation, right? So body of your presentation is consistent of facts and your ideas about whatever you're talking about. Your speech is your speech. You wrote it, you should know what you're talking about, right? So body is the main part of your presentation or speech. It's the actual content. Yeah, that, that makes sense somehow. So what you could do in a body, you should organize even the body. So you have a main structure, which is opening body conclusion, and then have some kind of structure in between the body. For example, very famous one, I'm pretty sure everybody have heard of it, is the rule of three. Sorry, that was four, three. <laughs> so <laughs> you have the rule of three. Do you know what the rule of three is? You're saying yes. <laughs> True. So rule of three is saying stuff in threes or like in a small group of points for people to comprehend better or to remember better. So for example, as I said, I already have three points. I have uh, opening, body, conclusion, right? That's three. Then I have the first three that I showed you. Also, our presentation is in three different sections, if you think about it. So it's a lot of threes at na uh, for you, maybe. But in general, it will be easier for you to follow if you know that this is the first, second, the third part. So that was the rule of three. What you also can, how you can organize it better, you can use a different structures. For example, sometimes it's better to have a chronological structure. For example, when you're introducing a company, you start when it, when the foundation of the company, so when it started, a little bit of background history, uh, we start producing this and that, you produce this and that, and then you slowly go up to current state, so you will say, company is now doing great because they're producing this many products doing this. And then you do the pre prediction to the future, for example. See, it goes chronological. That's very logical. Then there is a spatial one. So the spatial one is following certain, certain paths. So how to do it. It's more like a description. So if we say we are building a house. So you first have a foundation. Then once you have the foundation, you put on bricks, and then you make the windows, and you know, like, something when you describe actually how to do it. Caus uh, ca causal? Causal, yeah, I think that's the word, right? Yeah. Causal is um, 
when you have a cause and effect. With this, it's sort of different because I say first cause and then you have an effect, but first you should talk about the effect and then what is the cause of the effect. So it's a little bit out of way around. So you need to think about when you use this one so people don't get too confused. Then topical is the typical one. You have one topic and then you have some subtopics. All right, so I have a topic, public speaking, and my subtopic will be body language during public speaking. So you keep it very topical. There are different structures and it depends always on what you're going to talk about. So it's not only, you know, like structure of whatever, but you have to actually think, am I, am I going to talk about something like lecture or am I going to talk about the effect of something? Am I trying to persuade somebody into something? There's always a little thought behind it. And the last thing that you always need for your actual body is supporting materials. I'll be talking about it a little bit later, but you need supporting materials. Without that, you can't be credible. Moving on to, we have conclusion. That would be lovely, it wouldn't be. So conclusion shouldn't be just a regular summary of your speech or your presentation. You know the last one, thank you for your attention. Uh, so this was my presentation, bye. What people usually do, there is a mistake, there is a common mistake between everybody. Especially in Toastmasters, I've noticed a lot of our members still do it, even though they're a little bit advanced. They don't have enough time for a conclusion. So you talk too long during your body or you have too long of an intro, and then for your conclusion, you conclude it in one sentence and you leave. And then people are usually puzzled about it. They don't know whether you wanted to say something more or they may wanted to hear something more, but if you just all of a sudden cut it, it seems incomplete. So what are the basic rules for conclusion? It should have some kind of review or summary of what you were talking about. You should not add new information into your conclusion, so it should only contain the information you said before. And uh, what you can do also for conclusions is, for example, call to action. You know those kind of like YouTube videos when they at the end, subscribe, hit the like, that's a call to action. Or for us, it's usually when you're given a presentation, it's um, start now, connect with us, do this, do that. That's a call to action. And that is usually at a cautious type of uh, presentation when you're trying to get people to know something. Call to actions are great usually, but what is even better for me at least is memorable statement. Pick a small quote at the end. If you're talking about how people are negativists and like how to become more positive, your last sentence could be, there will be no rainbow without rain, right? That can be your little statement at the end and then it'll be like, thank you very much, doodles. You know, you have to think about something to actually round it up nicely so people will know that this was the end. They will not expect anything else. And as I said, leave yourself some time for a conclusion. Conclusions are usually shorter, but at the same time, if you don't have enough time, it doesn't work. Moving on, transitions. As you may see, I use moving on, going on, furthermore, a lot of transition words, right? Or I call them the nice and flowy words. When you have a transition between opening, body, and conclusion, People can follow you better. Just think about it. If I go, okay, body is blah, blah, blah. Stop for a second. Conclusion is blah, blah, blah. You feel a little bit un, out of a place, right? It doesn't feel right. There, there is something missing. So transition words are great. Transition doesn't have to be only with the words. It can be, for example, if you have a group presentation, which happened to me quite a lot. When people are just, they're finished with their part, and now they are staring at you like, your turn? No, your turn? If you don't know what, is follow, uh, what follows, your audience have no clue what you're going to do, and they're a bit puzzled, and the flow is disrupted. So the nice, 
thing that you're trying to organize the whole time is no longer there. Research your topic. Everybody tells you research, 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 do this, do this, find more information about it, know your stuff, do what you want to do. That is true. If you're writing a speech, for example, about famous people who, from Forbes 500, you need to do your research about these people. You can't just come on a stage and say, I know one person and this person did this. And that's it. No, you need to be prepared. So the best way how to do it is find as many sources as you can, either books, internet, uh, you can uh, interview people, whatever, you, whatever floats your boat, as I would say but compare the sources. It happens quite a lot if you, for example, are from a different country. I come from Slovakia, and I can speak Dutch and English, and whenever I'm researching something, I always look at all three. For example, if you go to Wikipedia, you can check all three languages, right? And I was once doing this presentation, which was absolutely great presentation about this countess in Slovakia, and all of a sudden, she was actually a murderer. And at one page, it said that she killed about 200 people. On the other one, it says, oh, about 12. And the third one, so about 30. And I'm like, now, which one is the right one, right? So you need to compare your sources in order to find the right information. Supporting materials, I mentioned them before. Gather your supporting materials. Those are testimonies, examples, stories, visual aids, facts. So visual aids are usually presentations. You know, something that people can stare at only so they don't stare at you, or you can have papers or nice graphs, whatever you need and can help you. But don't use visual aids that can actually distract from you, because then people tend to pay more attention to the visual aid and lose the focus. Come on if, if you want. I guess not. All right, and uh, the last third part of uh, research your topic is think about the audience. Keep it at their level. If you're going to do research, for example, biomass. How many of you know something about biomass? None of you, see? So if I give you my thesis presentation right now, you will have no clue what I was talking about because it was specially meant for my teachers and for my research company. So you have to think about your audience. If you're going to talk to kindergarten kids about helping in Africa or something, you know, you need to keep it at their level. You can't just tell them facts and figures and this kind of thing because they won't understand. It's the same with you students. We are now studying, also I am still studying, all this kind of business stuff and um, you can study whatever you study here. I study business, and whenever I was at a lecture, sometimes it happens that you don't understand quite a word or something. But they know that they have to, lecturers have to adjust it so students will understand what they actually meant, because we are not really good at it yet, right? Same with your boss. Your boss may be a specif uh, specialized in one area, but you're working on a project from different area. And if you explain it to him from your point of view, it might, he might not understand, so you need to sometimes dumb it down or sometimes dress it up a little bit nicely, you know? Like, you have to adjust it. That was the research topic. Sources, supporting material, and keep it at audience's level, right? And the last one I'm going to talk about is get to the point. So you have two purposes in your speech. One is the general one, and one is the specific purpose. So the specific purpose is the why you're doing this, right? So you have to word it, you have, it has to be specific enough and attainable. Also, it should be like one sentence. When you say it, people will be like, yes, this presentation meant this. General purpose of your presentation can be different. It can be to inform people, to persuade them, or to entertain, to inspire. It all depends on what kind of presentation or speech you are given. And without further ado, I think that was it from me. And Aldrich is going to tell you something about delivery. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> so now is the time to focus on our body. 
voice and face. You know, words means a lot, but according to some research, actually, that is the m minority of the percentage where actually influence people. So if you really think about it, your words do matter, but what you do besides your words matter even more. So I will focus on first the voice, focal variety, body language, and face. And let's start with vocal variety. I will first discuss speed and volume, low tone, and silence, and what impact it has on your audience. So if, we, if you look at this, basically the main idea is that what, if you think about it, why do people sleep in, in class? Why, when someone talks, you, you are so bored and you lose your attention? And this is specifically the reason uh, why you should focus on this. For example, if you want to focus on something really important, let's say this is really important. This is really important. This is really important. This is really you see the difference, how you feel it? So basically, I want to, we're going to do some exercises with this one. Let's focus on the low tone. Research shows that if you use a very, very high tone, it would seem almost as submissive. Uh, that's what you use with your friends. You know, hey, how are you doing? How are you going? If you do this to people, with your friends, it's perfect, it's fine. However, if you're in a business environment, it will be completely wrong, because people will see you as doubtful, and that's not good. So let's try this. I have an exercise. Uh, I want you to say, my, hi, my name is Aldrich Kelly. Of course, you're not going to use my name, but use your own name. Uh, what I want you to do is that pay attention to the lowest part, so try to bring it uh, bring your tone down. For example, at the end of your name, you don't say Aldrich Kelly, you say Aldrich Kelly. You see the difference? I mean, imagine you're talking on your phone, you're selling something to someone, and you say, my name is Aldrich Kelly. What, you're not sure about what your name is? You see how, how they can perceive you? And the same, if you're, if you're negotiating, negotiating a price, do you say, oh, it's $5? You are begging people to negotiate with you. And this is the difference. So who wants to try it? Hi, my name is. And at the end, bring it down. Any volunteers? You want to try it? Yeah. Can you please stand up? You see how he did it? It went up. <laughs> And if you say someone, and then people would think, oh, is it really your name or not? So can you please do it again? But then focus on going below, yes? Perfect. Please, let's give him a round of applause, yeah? <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Someone else want to try it? Yes, sure. You see, you see we, all, we also have to think about the speed. You've, you rush to your last name. So you also want people to listen to you. So it has to be like, a, please uh, increase the volume. And also, don't, don't, you don't need to rush. The thing with speed is, the faster you go, the less people understand what you're saying. And in, when you're speaking, the slower you go, it's the better. So let's try it again. Ah, perfect. Applause, please. Yes. At the end, you did go down, but your volume also went with your last name. So please pay attention to that as well, because people need to listen to your whole name and last name. So let's try it again with louder volume. Thank you. Anyone wants to try? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Right. Like in American culture, you have the movie Clueless. That has changed the youth forever because they, use, they go high all the time and it has become something popular to do. However, if you apply this in business, it can be interpreted the wrong way. Silence is golden. Whenever, when, whenever you're speaking and you really want to make your most important part of your speech, you can take a, a pause and then say what you want to say. If you apply this, it will have so much impact. This is really important. Don't you think? You see what I did there? <laughs> yes? So please, pay attention to this. And this will change how the audience will see you as well. You know what I did once? We were speaking at, I was giving a speech at Toastmasters. And this person right in front of me was just chatting, looking at the phone. So I was speaking, and I realized that. So I just shut up. I kept quiet. And I went a step ahead, and I kept looking at that person. Everyone in the room started looking at the person. So he felt pressure, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So that is one of the th techniques you can do as well. You can use silence to grab people's attention as well. When people are on their phone, you know, sometimes when something is repeating, or when you're watching TV, and some, it becomes nothing, the noise, you don't even notice it anymore, right? And that's what the silence does, it breaks. So the main idea about vocal variety is you break pattern. So basically what this means is that you change your volume, you go higher, you go lower, you increase, put pauses in there. You know some people talk for quite a long time and they keep going the same rhythm. Have you noticed that? Do you have some teachers like that? Yes? I'm not going to ask for names, but can I see how many how of you have teachers like that? Yes? OK. So please tell your teachers this. This is really important for them as well. <laughs> the next is body language. How, how many of you have heard about open and body language? Yes? So I'm going to skip the basics so you know it. So everyone, please stand up. Yes? Okay, yes. Okay, I'm gonna count. Everyone freeze, don't move. Don't move. Don't move. If we can see, what's your name? Remco. Sorry? It's Remco. Ah, you see what Remco did right there? He was standing very relaxed. This is the most relaxed position ever. Your hands on the side. Scientifically proven. And when I asked him a question, he immediately put his hands behind. And this is a way to defend yourself. It's an automatic response. So it's, it's nothing bad, uh, but it's an automatic response. If you see it here, for example, we have touching hands, and it's cover our body. It is instinctive in us. You know, back in the days when people had uh, fires and in the jungle, etc. Uh, it was very dangerous, so people were very cautious about whether the person that you meet has, is going to kill you or do any harm to you. And we've kept this tradition till now, so whenever we feel threatened or insecure or not sure, we close ourselves. So one tip, uh, you moved, but you also had your hands like this, right? Yes. Uh, I don't know how to put this. <laughs> This is very, this could be very dangerous when you're presenting, put your hands like this. Hey, I want to show you something. Like the special area, private areas, you know, like showing something. So that can be very dangerous uh, or can be interpreted very wrong as well. So it's a good, good way. Let's, yeah, just leave it loose. And also hands in pockets. That's one of the things you should avoid as well because it's kind of a closing gesture. The, the whole thing about this is that people 
listen to you if they like you or not. And if you want them to like you, you have to, you have to change to open body language. So that means body, uh, feet. Let's everyone do like this. Yes, like a bit still. Make sure it's always pointing our, outwards because once you put inwards, that means you're closing yourself as well, right? It's the same with shoulders. If you're standing like this, especially when you're nervous, you, it goes automatic. You want, okay, I don't want people to know I'm nervous, but actually you're, you're expressing everything. So shoulders should be just like that, yeah? Okay. I want to share this with you because I found this really important and the palms. Can everyone show their palms? Whenever you're giving a presentation, please show your palms. Who knows why? Okay, it's written there, but. <laughs> <laughs> if you want your audience to trust you, not even your audience, if you want your friends to trust you, if you want your family to trust you, anyone, show your palms. That's why this, this also seems, I say like, I put my life in your hands, it's for a reason. So whenever, you can even use it at the beginning. Hi, how are you doing? You're showing your palms. And this goes back to the same, same uh, back in the past where I don't have nothing to hide, I'm not gonna kill you, I don't have a knife hidden anywhere, I'm safe, you can approach me. Do you know that if you just adopt this, if you go to a bar, for example, and if you just do these things, people will start approaching you. I'm not even kidding, it's incredible. I've, I've tested this once, uh, it really worked. I went to this networking event and I tried to apply all this body language and for some reason people start approaching me, talking to me. Uh, suddenly, I, apparently I seem very friendly or something. So it really works. Palms down, what effect, who knows what effect this has? Like this. Like, try, try to think about it. Like, you, can you go there? You, can you go there? Does it feel a bit aggressive? Like, no. <laughs> now, compare this, like, can you uh, please move there? So you see, whenever you use palms, always palms up. Let's try it. Always. This. You know what I had? I'm gonna. I'm gonna go straight to it. Or leave. I just want to show you. In those masters, sometimes we film ourselves, and I've noticed that I have penguin hands. So I did like, hey, how you do? Like you know, like this the whole time. I didn't realize it until I watched myself. So one thing I would recommend you as well to film yourself, then you see a lot of weird things that you really do. It's incredible. So then now I have to lose more, I have to pay attention to it. But always palms up and always show your palms. Never palms down. You know who did this? Hitler. Why? Because when you put your, your palms down, it means that I feel superior to you. I have the authority to you. That's what palms down means. And that's the same reason they use it. And it's actually uh, very psychological as well, because it, all these things are mental. People, people uh, you can change people, how people feel about you just by changing these things. Isn't it incredible? And research has shown that it doesn't only change how people see you, but it also changes how you see yourself. Because then, when you use open gestures, your testosterone starts working like crazy, and you get the energy. These are the secrets that you should apply to all your presentations. Whenever you're using numbers, please number them. You remember a while ago, you said, yeah, the first thing that I will talk about is this, the second thing that I will talk about is this, the third thing that I will talk about is this. Oh, I have 10 cats at home, I have only five dogs, one fish, so lonely. You see? So please try, try saying something and use your, your enumerations. Uh, you wanna try? Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> this seems like an AA meeting. <laughs> Next victim. You wanna try? Oh, 
Genau, das wird. <laughs> Second, increase and decrease. Decrease. Let's try it with a sentence. I really, I, wait, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. A really big growth. So you see, you can use your hands to show uh, the size of things. But also, you can use this. A really big growth. Growth. Can you imagine if I do a really big growth? It will mess with your head and people don't remember. All these things you do so people can remember what you're doing. This is just a little problem. Imagine if I do, this is a, just a small problem. It doesn't match, right? And this is, this is something I've noticed some politicians do. This is really important for me. So when you put your heart, whenever you use your hands and at your heart gesture, you tell the other people this is important, you have to listen. So it has two functions here. So can anyone try it? I really want to see how you do it. Volunteers, try it. So they tell the marketing and talking is really important. <laughs> <laughs> You got, the, you got the, the hand right, but the vocal variety is a bit... Uh, try, try it again and try it uh, lower speed and higher volume like, and deeper voice. Okay, so the slower? Yeah, slower. No, no, try it. Okay, try this. It was really important for me. Really, really important. Ah, nice. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Anyone wants to try this? Mena? Because it's really important to me. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> And the other one, contrast. This is kind of tricky as well. For example, you use one hand for something and the other hand for something. For example, Republicans and democ Democrats. The Republicans have spoken a lot today, but the Democrats, not really. So you see you're using one hand and the other, and this will guide people, and it will help people to understand your message as well, and remember it. The same as cats and dogs. The vision. We were apart, but then we came together. Politicians do this a lot. You really have to watch them. They're incredible with their gestures. So we were apart, but then we came together as one. And this will really impact the audience. Ah, pointing. Of course, we, will, we should never appoint because it's very aggressive. Unless you're in a fight and you have no interest in showing your communication skills. But other than that, this is really, really aggressive. One, yes? How to speak? When you, no, this, yes, exactly. This is very aggressive. I mean, parents do this to their baby when they're being very naughty. And you don't want that. So one way to do it is your palms up. You can try it, try it. So just do this, yeah. Exactly. Or this. This is the magic hand gesture of politicians. Can you try it? Yes. It's pointing with your thumb. It's just yeah, it's ever. <laughs> I will make this great again. Yes. <laughs> he so always you're not, does that. It's, you're not pointing. It's, it's half of, oh, everything is OK. It's half of this, and you're still pointing. But it's very subtle. And politicians use this a lot. Pay attention to it. If you want to establish some connection with the audience, like, yeah, me and you have a great time together. You know, you can refer you and me, etc. You're really good. I'm not sure if I'm that good, but maybe I will still beat you. You know how I change from me to you? And you can use this as well. Jazz hands. 
<laughs> just sentence is just another word for when you use a lot of things that doesn't correspond to what you're saying. Oh yes, I like to go to the to the car and the car is nice, but you know, it's crazy and I don't know what I'm doing with my hands because it's going everywhere and doesn't correspond to what I'm saying. And these are just hands. I want to share with you one tip about eye contact because this is very strange. When you talk, how do you, how do you look at your audience? One thing you should not do is gaze around. Like, yes, I'm talking to you, but I'm not really. I'm just looking everywhere all the time. And I'm not looking at anyone. So the one tip is you focus on one person at one time. And you choose, for example, when I'm giving an idea, I talk only to one person. And they feel they're connected. Like right now, I'm walking towards you, and I'm, I'm walk, looking at you straight. You know who's done this? Bill Clinton. When he had, the, when he had to gather with the real people, uh, the real Americans, and he did this. He walked close, and he talked to them. And another trick is also do this. <laughs> Please, can we try it? Yes. If you want someone to agree with you, you're pitching an idea, you should do this. I think we should all go to, where do you want to go? Australia. Australia, <laughs> Disneyland. I know you don't have a lot of money, I understand, but I really feel that we should go because I think you will have a good time there. You know, so it's also a putting, like a giving idea to, yes, they should agree. And last, Phyllis. Right, you might find it a bit weird that Aldrich is always clapping, but that's something we do at Toastmasters. We always clap every single time someone says something, we just show our appreciation for them talking, so that's, that's the reason why. And we also shake hands, so that's what he also did earlier, just so you get kind of an insight in what we do. Now that we know how to gather our content and how to deliver our content, we have to move on to the most important part, which is the state. The state is the condition that you're in as soon as you walk through that door, the feelings that you have, your mindset. And I personally believe that this is the part where you can change the most with tiny changes. And when your mind is set, your body and everything else follows. The state consists of three things. Again, the three. It's the body, the mind's eye, and your beliefs. Let me run you through this. The body in general is movement. I won't talk more about this because Aldrich already covered most of it, and it's just the movement, your facial gestures, uh, your facial expressions, and your hand gestures. You can really use that purposefully. However, your body has a really big impact. And what I found funny, when he made us freeze, I stood like this. And in the beginning, I stood like this as well. And you know what that is? It's a power pose. And we learned that in ICM in the first year. I'm second year now. And we learned that in the beginning that you can use those power poses. And we all laughed. We're like, huh, this doesn't work. Guys, it's actually working. Could you please get up, all of you, and choose one of the power poses? I would say you can do the last one. And the, the standing up one, I call this Superman or Superwoman in my case. And if you do that before a presentation, take your shoulders back, you feel more powerful. This body posture has an impact on your mind. And you can literally do that before your presentation, and it works. Before you have to speak to your boss, just sit there for five minutes, it actually works. Get up, go and talk to your boss, it will have an impact on the way you feel. So that's one thing. The second thing is your mind's eye. It's about your focus. So very often when you start talking, you will only focus on the negative things, which is based on our evolution. However, we have to refocus. Meaning, now I could ask myself, oh my god, how does my hair look? Are these shoes too high? What am I going to do? What if they all judge me? You have to refocus. Your mind wanders, but focus is very important because it's what you set your mind onto. 
that is present for you. Which brings me to the next part, which is your beliefs. Because your beliefs are the lenses through which you see the whole world. Meaning right now, I can see you through different lenses. I can change them. I am the one to decide what to focus on, right? So now, I could say, there's people watching their phones. People, they're yawning, and everything's bad here, right? If my beliefs are that you're absolutely disengaged and it's not really nice what I'm talking about, I just have the belief that you won't trust me, you're not even interested. But I bet if you change your belief and say, all right, I believe that you're all here because you want to learn something and you're interested in what I'm talking about, I will see as many positive proof for the things that I believe. So there's people looking at me. They all have their eyes open and they're not sleeping. And people are like leaning forwards towards me because they're interested. So if you think about that, your mind has great power and you should use it. Also, if you think about beliefs, they're like a stool, meaning you have different legs, which are references, and that's what your lenses are built on. So you can't sit down if you don't have a strong set of beliefs, right? So pick them wisely, question all your beliefs, and make sure that you have the right ones, because very often we don't even realize that we're getting into a spiral and just drag ourselves down. So something that is very closely related to your state is managing anxiety. And I'm saying managing because it's not controlling. You can't control your anxiety. It's kind of a paradox itself. It's something that is natural, and we can all feel it. So that is why you shouldn't try to control it, but rather manage it. So you can bring everything together and use it purposefully and use anxiety as something that you reframe. All right, how do we do that? First of all, you have to be mindful. You greet your anxiety. So the moment you get in and you realize, okay, it's five minutes until my presentation and I'm feeling really bad. Can you feel that? Say, okay, I'm feeling bad. I'm scared. I feel this fear, but it's okay, guys, because this is something natural and just being mindful about it already changes the whole perspective. The second part that you have to do is to reframe the situation. So right now what I'm doing is I'm having a conversation with you rather than just giving a presentation to you. And it's not a challenge. Whenever you have to give a presentation, don't see it as a challenge, but rather see it as an opportunity. Because this is an opportunity for me to learn something and to share my knowledge with you. And every single time you get up on the stage, you learn something. Opportunity and not challenge, okay? And lastly, we have to be present oriented. I'll just do one last exercise with you and then I'm done. And I'll show you how you can be present oriented because it's very important that you focus, just as I told you earlier. It's very important that you don't focus about what might happen, about judging or whatever. Be here on the stage. So I'm going to tell you a tongue twister, and you will say the phrases after me. And the special thing is it's one of my favorite tongue twisters, actually, because if you don't say it correctly, there might be a naughty word slipping out of your mouth. So I'll say the, the sentence first, and you repeat it after me, OK? I slit a sheet, say it, I slit a sheet, a sheet I slit, sheet I slit, and on that, look, that, that's my problem now, and on that slitted sheet, I sit. All right, you all got it right, because no shit's there. <laughs> so in that very moment, you were focusing on just saying it right. Obviously, I wasn't focusing enough. So I have to practice that myself, but we're all here to practice, right? However, this is something everybody does. People that get on a stage, they listen to music, there's some pre presenters or people that give presentations, they do 100 push-ups before that, because you can't do anything but it be in the present moment. And with that being said, just to remind you, you have your state, your mind is very strong, you have body, 
your mind's eye, as well as your beliefs. And in addition to that, you can manage your anxiety really easily by greeting your anxiety first and being mindful. Secondly, by reframing the situation and not seeing it as a challenge, but rather as an opportunity. And thirdly, to be present oriented and be in the moment. All right, now I would say that you come back up and rewrap it all up. Just to remind you, we now gave you free tools again. We started with content. And also, not only words are important, but also how you say it is important. And of course, before you say anything, you have to focus on your mind. So if you use those three parts and put it together, you now have your toolbox. We're sure that you can all succeed in giving badass presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes. If you have any have... question, you can come ask us now, or you can catch us outside, or come to our meeting. We have a bonus for you guys. <laughs> if you're really interested, for your next presentation, if you're really interested, we are willing to give you a free session on how to improve yourself. This will involve identifying what, you, how, what you're really good at and how you can improve. So if you want that, we are willing to give you a free session. If you want it, you can write your name or information, and we will contact you. Just Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yes, I'll then put it there. Yeah, of course. If you stand like this and you're going to start a presentation, it's not OK. So I, th I think that if I stand like this, it's like lazy. How should I stand? Give me a second. <laughs> 